seeds in pre-war agitation, pre-war troubles. And we're going to talk about those pre-war fault lines tonight. Okay, so one of the most important fault lines is that the county itself was a fault line. Uh, essentially, the northern part of the county, uh, where in Monmouth County had six townships, Upper Freehold, Freehold, Middletown, and Shrewsbury. Um, most of those townships were densely settled on good farmland. There were a number of significant towns, uh, including Allentown, Freehold, Middletown Point, which was Matawan, Middletown, Shrewsbury. Um, in comparison, uh, the southern part of the county, which would be Ocean County today, the townships of Dover and Stafford, and the, the southernmost parts of Shrewsbury Township, uh, which would include areas today like Howell and Farmingdale and Manasquan, uh, was not good farmland. It was not well settled. It was not wealthy. Um, and while the northern half of the county had several towns and several roads, the southern half of the county had one road called the Cedar Path, which was impassable much of the year uh, because it was swampy, muddy, underwater, large parts of it. And it had really one town of note, Tom's River. Um, what both parts of the county had in common were they had uh, restive populations of their poorest most residents. And in the northern half of that ca the county, the poorest residents were in general uh, slaves and indentured servants, basically uh, slaves obviously being African-American, indentured servants very often being Irish, but not exclusively. Um, and in the southern part of the county, there was also a rest of population, but there we had sailors, migrant laborers, um, and you know, what was called at the time ne'er-do-wells, people who basically squatted. Maybe they made someone who basically lived uh, lived in the shore, maybe maybe with uh, with a, a milk cow, and they grazed on land that wasn't theirs, and stole a chicken every once in a while and steered clear of other people. And there was a lot of land and a lot of time and people steered clear of them because they could be violent. And um, it was uh, an area that might in some ways remind you of sort of the Wild West uh, that we hear about in a hundred years later. Okay. Let's talk, start by talking a little bit then about this rural, poorer part of the county. And rather than me doing that for you, I'm gonna read you uh, a couple of quotes. So the Quaker missionary, John uh, Griffith, travels through Lower Monmouth County in 1767, a decade before the war, uh, notes that he traveled to a place called Good Luck. Good Luck, by the way, is just north of Tom's River. Um, there is a single meeting house there served by all congregations, but of course they don't let Catholics in, as you can see. And he observes that um, we had a poor meeting there. Uh, we had a poor low meeting at Manasquan, just north of Good Luck. I doubt, but a few therein were alive with religion. Um, another uh, uh, missionary touring the shore a few years later would end up at uh, Fork, Forked River. And his, co his comment on the people of Forked River, uh, he calls them loose libertine people. Um, so for the uh, more, more religious, more straight laced, more cultured uh, people, the shore was rough terrain. Um, this was uh, a problem recognized by the New Jersey Provincial Assembly, the government of New Jersey which noted that there were a lot of people down on the shore who basically owned a, a, a one or a few animals and just grazed on other people's land. They didn't own land themselves. They owned a couple animals and they just kind of migrated uh, depending on the season up and down on other people's land. And so the assembly had to pass an act 
where they essentially deputized some of the more respectable people in the region to be managers and gave them authority to fine these um, migrants and their duels for uh, trespass. Um, and then of course we have a riot that occurs in, in the Lower Shore region in March, 1773 um, uh, against James Mount. Uh, routers, disturbers of the peace with sticks, staves and other weapons did assemble and gather together and did unlawfully riot, unlawfully riot for the space of an hour and a half upon one James Mount did make an assault. Um, so there's violence in the region as well. Okay, um, we, we tend to have a Williamsburg influenced uh, understanding of the colonial era. And when I say that, those of us who've gone to Williamsburg, which you know is a, is a wonderful uh, place in so many ways, but nonetheless, everyone at Williamsburg is clean and everyone's fully employed. And uh, the colonial period was very tumultuous and that wasn't always the case. So I, I put on this slide a sampling of some criminal activity in pre-war Monmouth County. Uh, first, there, the assembly compensated a posse for going out and apprehending three violent criminals, Daniel Johnson, John Fagan, and John Grimes. Um, and importantly, uh, two of these names, Fagan and Grimes, these two families will become infamous uh, a few years later during the revolution for uh, being pine robber families. Um, we also have in 1769, a silversmith from Shrewsbury uh, being put in jail for debauching his own daughter, uh, a 15 year old. Um, we have a horse thief and we have a larceny charged uh, against uh, Jacob Fagan. Jacob Fagan during the revolution would become one of the most famous of the pine robbers. Uh, nonetheless, while, while I, I sort of hopscotch some violent crimes here, uh, the most common crime in Monmouth County and indeed in most of the colonies was debt. If you took out a, a loan and you didn't pay it back, uh, you would be put in jail or in a work house scenario uh, to allow, uh, first of all, punish you for entering into a contract that you couldn't honor, uh, but also through through your forced labor, uh, perhaps paying down some of that debt. Counterfeiting was a problem throughout the colonies, um, but for whatever reason, Monmouth County uh, had, had more than its share of counterfeiters. Uh, so the colonial newspapers document three different counterfeiting rings in pre-revolutionary Monmouth County. Um, interestingly, uh, one of the counterfeiters who was captured, Arthur Layton, uh, ended up in the public pillory at Freehold, uh, where the fellow was most terribly bruised with eggs and stones by a crowd. Um, other counterfeiters uh, were able to get away, as you see, the November 1773 newspaper report notes that unluckily some of the gang of counterfeiters have made their escape out of the province. Um, counterfeiting was uh, particularly important uh, in this time period uh, because this was a period of very tight money. Uh, the colonial uh, governments were based on British policy at the time were not permitted uh, to print as much money as uh, the citizens of the colonies would have wanted them to print. And so this was a period of very tight money and, and, and inflation as a result. Monmouth County had uh, a lot of slaves. More than 10% of the county's population was African-American. And depend, uh, Quakers during this period were purchasing uh, freedom for slaves. Um, but there's also quite a bit of slave agitation uh, and quite a bit of runaways. Uh, so this was a period in which um, from the colonial newspapers, uh, I can find 14 slaves ran away, three more indentured servants ran away. Um, interestingly, just uh, 
excerpting a couple of these things. One slave ran away with a gun. Um, another, uh, a, another slave um, would be easiest to catch uh, if you get him to drink because he's very talkative. Um, and a servant man, William Fenton. Fenton, another name that uh, shows up in the, in the, among the pine robber gangs, um, was worried that he would go off to a vessel uh, and become a sailor so that the masters of the vessels were, were forbid to carry him away. Two of the most interesting residents of Monmouth County are John Morris and Trevor New Newland. Why are they so interesting? Because they're British officers from the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War. I wish I knew how they ended up in Monmouth County. I don't know. What I do know is that the uh, Board of Proprietors of East Jersey uh, owned large tracts of land, particularly along the shore, and was gradually uh, giving the, the, that land away or selling off that land uh, to people who would homestead there. And two of, two, uh, these two officers were both given land along the shore. Um, as a reminder, though, shoreland, by and large, is not good farmland. Farming was the ticket to uh, acquiring wealth. So for these two officers, who, are, oh, by the way, are, are not farmers by trade and then are put on land that isn't good farmland, uh, that's not a recipe for success. And so uh, Trevor Newland, uh, shortly after uh, settling, and he settled uh, just south of uh, Tom's River, apparently had a little bit of a relationship with Benjamin Franklin. And he notes that he uh, has nothing to do in Monmouth County. Uh, he can't get work. Um, and he uh, meets in his interactions with the locals are not positive. He meets with none who are inclined to serve our state, meaning people who are not improving the land, people who are not doing things like building roads and trying to dredge the harbors so larger vessels can come in. Um, uh, John Morris is further north. John Morris is around Manasquan. Um, both of them eventually get uh, patronage positions in the New Jersey government, um, probably in the interest of giving them a little bit of a salary. And Newland's position is particularly important. And I'll talk about it toward the end of tonight's talk uh, with respect to um, uh, being a officer of the peace at a time when there isn't a lot of peace. Um, and Newland and Morris have uh, a way of getting themselves in trouble at times. And so uh, we have an indictment from the Monmouth Court of General Sessions, which notes that John Morris and Trevor Newland on the 18th day of March, 1772 at Dover, uh, did set fire to the dwelling house of one Samuel Bennett and the same dwelling house did burn down. I wish I knew the backstory here. Uh, if anyone, uh, I know we have people here with great uh, ties into Monmouth County history. If anyone knows the backstory on that in this incident, please let me know. I, I so desperately want to understand what brought the two British officers who lived 25 miles apart together and what had what would have compelled them to commit arson against a, a citizen. Uh, Monmouth County also had Sons of Liberty's chapters. And a, as a reminder, uh, the British passed a number of uh, tax laws, uh, which the colonists hated. Among the most hated was the Stamp Act. Um, in response to the Stamp Act, starting in the cities like New York and Boston in particular, uh, groups of uh, groups organized uh, boycotts against uh, British goods that carried the hated stamps uh, and had the had the surcharge on them because they carried stamps. Uh, they committed violence against uh, tax collectors. Um, and they, you know, made quite a ruckus. It was the beginning of what would become Revolutionary War agitation. 
Uh, the Sons of Liberty agitation uh, did spread into Monmouth County. There were two Sons of Liberty's chapters. Um, they didn't spell sons so good. Um, but in any event, there were Sons of Liberty chapters in uh, Upper Freehold and Middletown. And, in, and they conducted, uh, these must have been active groups because they sent letters around and were in correspondence with, son, with larger Sons of Liberty groups in New York, Philadelphia, and far off Baltimore. So what were the Sons of Liberty about? Uh, the Upper Freehold Sons of Liberty uh, had, uh, produced a long document on their, uh, on, on their purpose. So first, they were animated with love and zeal for the good of our country, and they were convinced that uh, Parliament uh, what was, the British Parliament was taking acts to oppress the Americans. So they pledged to, to unite, uh, to assist this and neighboring colonies in opposing all attempts, all, all attempts uh, that have arisen to deprive us of our rights and privileges. Uh, they would assist all of the officers of government um, to meet with their duty. And for those that will not meet with their duty, they will meet with our disapprobation, um, which is interesting. This wasn't uh, the Sons of Liberty and the people who held office uh, were, uh, uh, by and large, the well-to-do. And people's reputation was everything. And so the first thing you would do is you would basically freeze out people who weren't behaving right. Uh, you would freeze them out of your social circles. Uh, you would freeze them out of attending church with you. Um, and you would stop doing business with them. Um, only later, and as a last resort, uh, did violence come from this. The Sons of Liberty, as a first uh, course of action, generally were, didn't. It was a, a sort of organized boycotts was the preferred order. Importantly, though, the Sons of Liberty also uh, said that they would behave ourselves peaceably as far as our influence extends and preserve his majesty's good order. So uh, not violent, uh, we're still a decade before the revolution and certainly not envisioning uh, a revolution coming at this time. The, uh, one of the things that was an absolute flashpoint and really hated by the colonists was uh, the forced quartering and financing of British soldiers. New Jersey did not have to uh, quarter as many British soldiers as the larger colonies, but nonetheless, there were still barracks at, at Trenton and Perth Amboy and Elizabeth. And Monmouth Countians, even though they didn't have to directly quarter these soldiers, uh, nonetheless petitioned on this subject in 1769. Um, they noted at this alarming period when oppressive measures menace and danger our constitutional rights of liberty, we are hereby determined to seek a restoration of our rights and liberties. They call on the assembly uh, to address the unconstitutional and arbitrary measures of parliament. Uh, they call that for no funds from the state to pay for the British soldiers and they call for a repeal on a hated local wagon tax, uh, which was used to pay for the British soldiers. Um, what did the British do about this? Well, you know, we, we, we tend to have this impression that the British were aggressive and with every time the colonists um, tweaked the British, the British came back 10 times harder. But actually, I, I, I haven't seen that. More often than not, the British caved. And that certainly happened in the case of the Quartering Act uh, and the New Jersey agitation. Um, in, in 1771, the New Jersey Assembly cuts the funding for the British soldiers and the, and the British respond by moving half of the soldiers out, moving them uh, to, to uh, what, would today, what was called West Florida at the time, but basically the Florida panhandle. Um, so the British backed down to this provocation at least. The biggest event in uh, pre-revolutionary Monmouth County were the land riots. 
And uh, I, I, I hope there are people uh, who already know a little bit about the land riots. I think they're really, really interesting. Um, there, they, there have been a couple of good things written about them, but here's what's going on. This is a period of, of tight money. So a farmer who takes out a mortgage, produces a surplus, sells that surplus, um, is not getting as much cash as the farmer had expected to receive. Therefore, the mortgage payment um, is, is larger than the farmer's ability to pay off the mortgage. Um, and the result in Monmouth County, but frankly, many other areas during this time period, is that there's a tremendous number of good families. We're not talking about the ne'er-do-wells here. We're talking about good yeoman farmer families that are defaulting on their debts and uh, people going into debtor's prison for periods of time. Um, but for whatever reason, Monmouth County's response to this phenomenon was uh, more severe than anywhere else in New Jersey. Um, the, land riots be the land riot agitation begins in July 1769 when 100 uh, plus Monmouthers sign a petition to the assembly calling for lower court fees for people who are carrying debts because if you are a farmer uh, who has not paid the mortgage, you're brought into court and then when you're found guilty, you owe the court fees for the person who brought you into court because you're guilty and you're inconveniencing them by making them uh, take you to court. Uh, they call for more printed money and lower taxes. And most importantly, they call for the suspension of the courts. They basically call for legal, the, the legal apparatus of Monmouth County to be suspended because it's not taking care of criminals, it's punishing good farmers who are just trying to get by. So the first riot uh, occurs on July 24th. Hundreds of Liberty boys come to Freehold. They erect a Liberty pole and they uh, uh, shout that the court shouldn't open. Uh, the colony's uh, attorney, Richard Stockton, who becomes a signer of the Declaration of Independence later on, has to ride through a hostile crowd, kicking at the men uh, to get away from his horse, uh, scuffling a little bit with the crowd as he dismounts. Um, but then Stockton uh, becomes uh, sympathetic with the crowd and he calls, he, he joins the crowd in calling for the court uh, to close. And so the court actually closes early and does not transact its business. Um, and then uh, a, a petition uh, is drafted to the New Jersey Assembly uh, calling uh, to allow debtors to restructure their debts and avoid prison and to allow petty debts to be settled in front of a magistrate without court fees. Um, the next court, because courts were quarterly, these are the courts of quarterly sessions, is October of that same year. Um, Prior to the court meeting, a number of the townships in Monmouth County uh, have meetings about uh, the economic situation and send members, uh, delegates in effect, to Freehold. As the uh, court begins, a hostile crowd gathers and the lawyer for the colony of New Jersey, Bernardus LaGrange, who is in the county courthouse, hearing the, the hostile crowd uh, gathering at the door, flees out the back window and heads out of town. Um, so again, the court does not meet. There is no prosecuting attorney uh, to hold the business of, of the colony. Uh, a petition is drafted. Um, it complains about the gentlemen of the law, the lawyers, who take the greatest part of the estates and expense uh, at our folly. It calls for an end of uh, estate foreclosures for small debts, lessening the number of courts to two annually and leniency to quiet the minds of the people. Um, after this, the New Jersey Assembly holds a hearing on, on what's going on. It's a big deal that the courts are not meeting. Uh, it's, it's an affront to uh, authority. 
Uh, so the assembly uh, summons LaGrange to an and have him answer for his conduct and his excessive fees. Um, and LaGrange is eventually censured for his high-handed contact and for his profiteering. But also censured is the one of the local magistrates for the county, John Foreman, um, for uh, a couple of reasons, including advising one man, a man named Carmen, uh, to run away when said Carmen was charged with attempting uh, rape. Uh, and Foreman is also censured uh, for holding public meetings in a tavern, which is below the dignity of a magistrate. The Foreman family, as you might know, uh, becomes very prominent during the revolution. Uh, Peter Foreman is a, is a judge of the courts. Uh, Samuel Foreman is a colonel of the militia. Uh, David Foreman becomes a colonel of the Continental Army, a, a, a briefly a general in the New Jersey militia, and then leads a vigilante society known as the Retaliators. Um, so the Foreman family being at the source of um, agitation uh, is not, it, it is consistent with what we'll see a few years later. Michael, can I cut in for a moment? Please. Um, Bernadette would like to know which tavern Foreman held the public meetings in. Uh, great question, but the answer is I, I don't know. We, we simply don't have uh, the documentation that allows us to know that. Okay. Um, you know, and, and there were, of course, a number of taverns in and around Freehold. Um, some, uh, Moore's Tavern still stands, but how many of the other, how many of the taverns of that period still stand? Uh, I suspect most of them don't. Right. Yeah. Great question, though. Thanks. Okay, now the climax. January 1770, the third riot. Um, so, uh, this riot gets uh, carried in newspapers. Uh, it, uh, the Pennsylvania Chronicle reports, a great number of those assembled in a tumultuous manner and absolutely refused the lawyers to come in. And the magistrates were so intimidated that uh, no courts were opened or held at this time. So the mob got there before the officers of the court. And again, the courts did not open. This time, Governor Franklin, uh, William Franklin, uh, Benjamin Franklin's uh, son, uh, but a British officer, uh, an officer of the royal government, uh, found the conduct so alarming in nature that he summons his privy council, his attorney general, and the Monmouth County Sheriff uh, to answer for the audacious insult to government and calls on the offenders to be punished in the most exemplary manner. He also calls for a special court of lawyer and terminer, which is uh, a court that is only held for special occasions, the most uh, significant of crimes. Um, the Privy Council will issue a report on the riot. Uh, the report includes uh, discussion about the uh, mob itself. Uh, notes that they were armed with clubs and other offensive weapons and did by their threats and outrageous behavior so insult the magistrates and officers of the court that they judged it neither safe nor prudent to attempt opening the court. Um, the report was also not kind to the rioters. It said they were unsupported by a single fact and that their cry against the lawyers is only raised to deceive us of the unwillingness of some and the inability of others to pay their just debts. Um, finally, uh, the governor uh, complains about the Monmouth County Grand Jury, which was uh, convened to, to uh, bring up charges on the rioters, um, but uh, delayed doing so. Uh, the Monmouth land riots were a big deal, and we know this because the January land riot is discussed in newspapers in New York, uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and even South Carolina. It also inspired a, a riot in Essex County, New Jersey. So um, while this is not a normal event uh, based on the response elsewhere, uh, the New Jersey Assembly uh, held 
held uh, another hearing and passed a law uh, in response to these riots, uh, calling them uh, the most dangerous and alarming tendency and the most audacious insult to government. Um, as a result, the law allows the governor to summon the militia to quell riots, um, and it uh, it creates it, it it calls on new laws for punishing rioters and sets a and reschedules the Monmouth County uh, courts. Um, however, even while taking this kind of tough retaliatory action, it does make concessions to the rioters. Uh, the rioters are uh, permitted under the new law to restructure debts under uh, 50 pounds and take care of them outside of court. Um, and the court uh, and the, the, the state passes another law for defraying incidental court charges, uh, which I assume uh, also grants relief on court fees. Um, lastly, uh, the uh, Assembly of New Jersey takes action against uh, the magistrate Josiah Holmes, uh, who has greatly misbehaved himself in that office. Um, what we find out later is that Holmes was accused as magistrate of basically working with the rioters. In the aftermath, uh, Holmes is fired. He's replaced by John Hartshorn, but Hartshorn refuses to do the job um, either because he's sympathetic to the rioters or because he fears for his uh, he fears for his safety, but the, the governor has trouble finding a magistrate. Who does he turn to? He turns to the British officer, Trevor Newland, uh, to take the job. Um, the, the New Jersey Assembly uh, also chastises the um, grand jury of Monmouth County. Um, and uh, finally, on May 7th, uh, a court does uh, uh, convene in Monmouth County. It does uh, move against seven debtors uh, and the foreclosures occur. But uh, my, my strong hunch is that that's only a fraction of the people they could have moved against. And the attorney uh, there for, for the colony of New Jersey, Walter Livingston notes, um, I have been this week engaged in trying the, the rioters of Monmouth County. Some were acquitted one fined and one imprisoned. Um, so we had this, this significant riot, two people uh, get punished among the rioters. Okay, uh, concluding thoughts then. Um, first, this is not a peaceful, easy, happy place. Uh, there's a lot going on in Monmouth County. There's a lot of economic turmoil. Uh, there's, uh, anim there's, uh, there are the rest of, uh, poorer populations. There's a shore region, which is not governed effectively. There's a good deal of law breaking. Um, I haven't done enough research on other areas in the same time period to be able to say Monmouth County was extraordinary or not. Um, I don't have that basis of comparison, but what I can say is for those of us who tend to think, uh, again, in this kind of Williamsburg context, that everyone in the colonies was fully employed and clean, uh, everyone in the colonies was not fully employed, and everyone in the colonies was not clean. And this sets the, my original thesis, uh, was Monmouth County so especially racked with civil war because it was so racked with problems and agitation before the war? And there's no doubt in my mind the, the answer is yes. Um, so with that, uh, I, I, I'll throw up uh, a little bit on the books, uh, which Dana was kind enough uh, to, to put up a slide early, early on. And I do maintain a website. Uh, you're welcome to visit at any time. If you ever want to email me or send me a note, you can always uh, send a note through the website. Um, with that, uh, and, and, and any remaining time, uh, very happy uh, to take questions and talk with you all. We, definitely, we do have some questions. Um, I don't know why I'm getting so much feedback, meaning uh, audio feedback. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, great. 
Um, we had a question, were there any Quakers in the Sons of Liberty? Uh, good question. And uh, the simple answer is, I don't know for sure. Um, what, we, what we do know is that the uh, Quaker meeting at Shrewsbury has excellent uh, records. Those records are preserved at Swarthmore College. Um, and we do have records of uh, who was in the Sons of Liberty, at least on the coordinating committees of the Sons of Liberty for both the uh, Middletown and Upper Freehold groups. So the Middletown group, if it had, if the Middletown Sons of Liberty, uh, Shrewsbury would have been the closest Quaker meeting. And it's possible to be able to look at those names and then see if any of those names show up at the Quaker meeting for those same years, 1765, 66. Um, but I, I have not done that. So uh, great question, but I don't know the answer. Okay. Uh, somebody else is asking if we have a list of Patriot um, retaliators and you would know from, from your time here, Michael, that we do have um, documents that list our Patriot retaliators. So I guess That's another- right. the the, uh, associate, the, the Articles of Association for Retaliation were signed by uh, hundreds of Monmouthers. It had, actually carries more signatures than any other Monmouth County document from the time period. Um, and those signatures uh, are, uh, ha have been, are, are in my data set. And uh, the articles of retaliation have also been reprinted in a couple of secondary sources. Uh, I, I think they're in Ellis's History of Monmouth County, for example. Mm -hmm. So would you say that the Sons of Liberty were like a precursor to the Association for Retaliation? Um, if they're a precursor, there's a lot of steps in between. Um, the, the Sons of Liberty, uh, were actually a precursor to um, committees of correspondence and committees of observation that uh, occurred immediately before the Declaration of Independence. And these committees became sort of the de facto local government of the colonies as, colon as British rule broke down. And those committees, I think, have uh, a, a direct connection to the Sons of Liberty. I think the retaliators um, become sort of a cousin of a cousin of a cousin of the of these more these more respectable and more consensus oriented groups that existed before the war. Mm -hmm. Um, we have somebody asking, actually, I'm not sure if Josiah Holmes was related to Asher Holmes. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not a genealogist of the Holmes family. There are an awful lot of people in revolutionary Monmouth County who carry the Holmes surname. Um, I doubt they are closely related uh, right. because uh, Asher Holmes lived uh, in what would today be Marlboro and Josiah Holmes lived around Shrewsbury. So I, I doubt they were closely related, but I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a genealogist of the Holmes family. Right, but Asher Holmes was a colonel, right? That's correct. Asher Holmes uh, would become colonel of the 1st Regiment of the Monmouth Militia, which mm -hmm. was, uh, which was uh, mustered out of Freehold and Middletown townships. Right, and we have all his papers here. It's really amazing to see that. Yeah, and, and just because we were talking about the retaliators before, um, Asher Holmes was a foe of the retaliators. And mm -hmm. I've, I've written previously on the tension between the Machiavellian patriots or Whigs and the, the due process rule of law guys. And Asher Holmes was very much a due process rule of law wig um, as the retaliators um, were do anything you need to do uh, to punish your enemies. Uh, and Asher Holmes did not go that way. Right. Was he ever part of, did he start off in the retaliators and then break off from them? 
That's right. The, the Association for Retaliation uh, articles are signed by almost every uh, Whig leader in Monmouth County. Um, but many of those leaders dropped out very early when the retaliators became a vigilante society. Okay, um, somebody is asking, do you think the turmoil or civil strife during the war can be linked all the way back to quit rent disagreements? Uh, good question. And, and the answer is, uh, I, what, what we do know is that uh, rioting uh, and um, evading taxes, counterfeiting, um, steal, uh, small acts of theft, small acts of revenge, uh, going into debt and not paying your debt and coming up with reasons for not paying your debt. Um, all of that is central to the colonial experience. And all of that set up uh, and made it possible for the colonists to say, no, we're not doing this just because the British are telling us to, um, because they were, they were lawbreakers and rule stretchers all along, um, whether it be uh, quit rents or anything else. Okay, um, somebody's asking if you know who owned or operated the Rising Sun Tavern in Clarksburg. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know, no. but there, uh, I'm, <laughs> There is a list of tavern licenses um, from, there are lists of tavern licenses. Um, and you, you may have some of those lists at MCHA. We do. And yeah. I believe the County Archives does also. Um, and those could be checked. Um, I'm not sure how precise they are on naming the tavern though. I believe that they go by the owner's name. So it'd be kind of hard to go through there. there there's hundreds of them. Um, so I'd have to take a look. So for the person, uh, Don, who asked that question, you can contact me at library at mammothhistory.org and um, we'll see if we can find that answer for you. Uh, someone else is asking, do you figure that some of the Mammoth privateers helped to keep Sandy Hook in the hands of the British? Mammoth privateer Sandy Hook in the hands of the British. So first let's let's uh, level set for, because there might be some people who don't know about Sandy Hook. Um, Sandy Hook is critically important in, in this time period because uh, Sandy Hook is the entrance into New York Harbor. And the, and the British uh, take Sandy Hook in April, 1776, you know, uh, when it appears that war of some kind is likely. And the British hold Sandy Hook until January, 1784. So Sandy Hook is continuously held by the British longer than any other piece of the 13 colonies. Um, and Sandy Hook becomes, during the war, Sandy Hook is the epicenter of the local civil war. The British Navy is, uh, controls it. There are New Jersey loyalists based there and a tremendous amount of raiding activity occurs out of Sandy Hook as raiders plunder into Monmouth County. And by the way, as Monmouth County farmers quietly uh, trade with Sandy Hook uh, to get uh, luxury goods and cash from the British in exchange for the products of their farms. Um, there's also privateers uh, who are very active in the Raritan Bay and along the uh, Jersey shoreline. And they harass uh, British shipping in and around Sandy Hook. They're never able to seriously threaten Sandy Hook, but uh, they definitely make the lives of the British at Sandy Hook miserable. Okay, and we have um, Randy Gabriellen. He's a, a local Monmouth County historian. And he mentions that, hold on one second. Um, Bob Craig published an article that revealed the revolutionary role of the Rising Sun Tavern, then known as Robin's Tavern. So uh, for the person who asked that question, maybe you could check out that article by Bob Craig. 
Oh, hold on. He just said he made a mistake. That's okay. I know it gets very confusing with all these taverns around here. <laughs> That's okay. No problem. Um, and Mary Hussey from the County Archives uh, mentioned that she did look into that and they very rarely mention the actual name of the tavern. So it, it's, a, it's a tough question to, um, to answer going back to that one. Um, we have another, did they, uh, did they execute people at the courthouse here in Freehold? Um, not during the pre-war period, or at least I don't have evidence that there are executions in the pre-war period, but there absolutely were hangings. Um, there, there were hangings uh, during the revolutionary period. In fact, one of the, and some of the hangings were done in a public way. And in the case of the hated pine robbers, uh, the pine robbers bodies were gibbeted and put it, put out on the public road uh, for display. So not only were there hangings, but the hangings were public events and people would turn out to watch the hated, uh, the, the hated villains get hanged. Um, there was also, uh, uh, and I've written a little bit about the murder of James Pugh. The, James Pugh was not uh, an especially hated loyalist. He was a he was uh, a contraband trader from Middletown who traded with the British um, and was captured. Um, and James Pugh was murdered inside a, a prison cell in the, in the basement of the county courthouse, murdered by a, by a, his, uh, his, a sentry who shot him while, while, while sitting in the, while he sat in his cell waiting, waiting trial. So um, by the, the war years, there's definitely um, scenes of, of, of execution and murder um, at the courthouse during the war. Okay. Does anybody else have um, more questions for Michael? Okay, we have um, Ross Lasitra. He is the commissioner. He says, Michael, on behalf of the Monmouth County Board of Chosen Commissioners, I would like to sincerely thank you and the MCHA for a wonderful presentation. It was very informative, and I hope to see more presentations like this in the future. Thank you. So that was nice. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. So it looks like uh, that's about it for the questions. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know I'm going to actually share my screen again here. See if I can do this. You're up. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> Let's see if it'll move. So we have your books. Oh, and um, everybody, if you want to take a look into Michael's books, you can get them at Amazon.com or the historypress.com as well. And our next, um, whoops, hang on. Our next presentation is February 11th. We have Gilda Rogers. She's the vice president of the T. Thomas Fortune Foundation. She's an educator and author and director. She's just amazing. She wears many, many hats. Um, and her lecture is titled Historic Preservation and Count Basie's Legacy. So she's gonna take us on a journey from the Great Migration to the Harlem Renaissance with a focus on the late great Count Basie of Red Bank, New Jersey. So we're looking forward to that. And thank you, Michael, so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, very informative. It was exciting to have you and we appreciate it very much. It's really my pleasure. And uh, uh, thanks always to MCHA for, for the great support. Okay, have a good night, everybody.